I'm respectable, says John Huston as Noah Cross in the movie Chinatown to Jack Nicholson as Jake Giddis. I'm old. Politicians, ugly buildings, and whores all get respectable if they last long enough. And then there is what happens when you are all three of those things, as the Supreme Court is all three of those things. Politicians, pretending to be justices, working in an ugly building, and as Trump relied upon and yesterday was proven correct, they are all whores. And I have lots to say about the supreme whores and what they have done and what they might yet do, which improbably enough includes making Joe Biden into an instant American king. Yet they are not the lead story because the lead story is after a weekend plus in which he made more than two dozen astonishing verbal mistakes in just two speeches and struggled through all the rest of the speeches, the evidence is mounting that what Donald Trump is suffering from is something called fluent aphasia. There are two million Americans with aphasia, a kind of catch-all for a series of communication disorders, ranging from the most familiar in which the ability to speak or to understand speech is eliminated or severely impaired, usually by a stroke or a head injury. But fluent aphasia, technically Wernicke's aphasia, may be the most terrifying, may be the most heartbreaking of them all because while the patient's ability to understand speech and to make himself understood via speech may be severely or totally limited, their ability to speak easily and smoothly is not. The cadence is right. The grammar is usually right. Long sentences are, at least at first, no problem. Things that sound like answers to your questions are there except... They are all with the wrong words. It's Trump. That's what Trump has been doing. That, and obviously this is a layman asserting this, I could be wildly wrong, but it is clear it is something like this. That is what he's been doing. Wernicke's aphasia, fluent aphasia, with growing frequency and an increasing tendency to bail out of things when he gets lost. Byron Peterson is now nearly 84 years old. He lives in Nevada. He has fluent aphasia, and he made a video for his therapists, and it is still used to raise awareness for this condition, which befell him not long after he hit his head after a fall. The first tape is Byron Peterson. The second tape is Donald Trump. Hi, Byron. How are you? I'm happy. Are you pretty? You look good. <laughs> what are you doing today? We stayed with the water over here at the moment and talked with the people for them over there. They're diving for them at the moment. They'll save him the moment. He'll have water very soon for him. With luck for him. So we're on a cruise and we're about to We to will store it right here and they'll save their hands right there for I'm them. Hello. Richmond, I'm thrilled to be back in the beautiful Virginia. We love Virginia. And perhaps most importantly, we are a nation that is no longer admired, respected, or listened to on the world stage. In the United States. So we call it migrant kind. I, come, I came up with that name because I come up with a lot of good names, don't I? And Putin, you know, has so little respect for Obama that he's starting to throw around the nuclear war today. You heard that, nuclear. Did you just see Maduro, Venezuela, well, it's uh, unbelievable. We will demolish the deep state. We will expel the wall mongers. Ding, boom, this is me, I, I hear, bing. Uh-oh, the red lights are starting to go off. Anytime I start talking, they take the red light off. Biden border will, well, you know this, right? The Biden border bill, look, he can't campaign, he can't campaign, he can't speak, he can't walk, he looks like hell. Adding on to the last two, total, at last Tuesday, they have pupils from foreign countries, from countries where they don't even know what the language is. We have nobody that even teaches it. These are languages that nobody ever heard of. Heard that Saudi Arabia and Russia will repeat your, oh. Trump? The presumptive Republican nominee and presumptive fluent aphasia victim cannot serve as president of the United States like that under any circumstances. 
as I first framed it nearly a decade ago, his brain does not work correctly. He should receive our empathy. We are not monsters here. And the therapies that can improve quality of life as his fluent aphasia or whichever form of aphasia or other brain injury or disease he has progresses. But he cannot serve as president of the United States and he should end his candidacy immediately. And if this needed to be more dangerous than it already appears, consider this. Trump's continued insistence that he aced some kind of simple cognitive test as if that proved he had an IQ of 350,000 may not just be him lying his way through yet more reality. He may have no idea that he's this sick. And even if somebody around him had the courage to tell him, he would not believe them because he's also been showing signs for years of another brain injury or illness called anosognosia. And Trump would not be the first at this level of government to suffer from it. Anosognosia. As the legendary David Dunning of Dunning-Kruger syndrome once wrote, an anosognosic patient who is paralyzed simply does not know that he is paralyzed. If you put a pencil in front of them and ask them to pick up the pencil in front of their left hand, they won't do it. And you ask them why, and they'll say, well, I'm tired. Or, I don't need a pencil. That pencil reference is not random. It mainlines back to the president who, in his lifetime, was credited with saving the American pencil industry, Woodrow Wilson. And as latter-day experts use new medical knowledge to study the stroke that Wilson suffered while on his famous cross-country tour to try to sell the League of Nations to America over the heads of a disapproving Senate, the conclusion has been widespread through the decades that whether or not he had it earlier, after that stroke, President Wilson showed all the signs of anosognosia. In the 1970s, neuropsychiatrist Edwin Weinstein was granted access to Woodrow Wilson's papers to diagnose what happened to him. And he wrote, quote, following his stroke, the outstanding feature of the president's behavior was his denial of his incapacity. Denial of illness or anosognosia, literally lack of knowledge of disease, is a common sequel of the type of brain injury received by Wilson. In this condition, the patient denies or appears unaware of such deficits as paralysis or blindness. To casual observers, anosognosiac patients may appear quite normal and even bright and witty. When not on the subject of their disability, they are quite rational, and tests of their intelligence may show no deficit, unquote. Unfortunately, when on the subject of his disability, President Wilson was anything but rational. His Secretary of State, Robert Lansing, summoned the cabinet to a meeting to discuss Wilson's illness. Wilson or his wife forced the resignation of Secretary of State Lansing. Doctors who challenged Wilson were dismissed. People who knew him before his stroke were eased out or denied further access. Wilson insisted until his death that, well, yes, he had had strokes. It only affected his walking, and only a little. So when you hear this and you realize Trump thinks nobody is noticing him just trailing off and sighing, think fluent aphasia and anosognosia. Saudi Arabia and Russia will repeat do it. Oh. Wow. I am indebted to the nation's leading authority on George Santos, the reporter Jacqueline Sweet, for putting the topic of fluent aphasia under my sometimes stuffed and incompetent nose. Because God knows, with Trump, we don't have enough to worry about. With him being crazy and evil and demented, we also need to worry about him having had a stroke or something creating an illness that makes it impossible for him to understand that he's had a stroke or something. So Trump may not have control of his own brain anymore, but at least he has control of his own Supreme Court. Unsurprisingly, the court betrayed democracy yesterday 
again. This time by going faster to help Trump. On presidential immunity, of course, it's going slower to help Trump. It's a versatile set of whores. Its members, including Jackson and Kagan and Sotomayor, who before folding stood up just long enough to wave bye-bye to representative government in this country, overruled one of the easiest parts of our Constitution to understand and did so for the benefit of one corrupt politician. Individually and as an entity, they have proved themselves inept at basic reading comprehension. They have proved themselves to be corrupt and illegitimate. The court's usefulness and relevance is at an end, and whatever replaces it, the immediate need is obvious. The Supreme Court must be dissolved. Because the Supreme Court is not just made up of whores. It's made up of incompetent whores. Quote, because the Constitution makes Congress rather than the states responsible for enforcing Section 3 against federal office holders and candidates, we reverse. Reads their decision on enforcing the 14th Amendment, denying insurrectionists the right to become president or hold other offices. Nine nothing, except it doesn't do that. Section 3, as conservative constitutional scholar after conservative constitutional scholar has repeatedly stated, is self-enforcing. It is automatic. If you engaged in insurrection, you're out. If you think you are being ill-treated by this, Section 3 provides you with an override mechanism. You can get the House and the Senate to each clear you, each by a two-thirds vote. Period. The Constitution says nothing about an enforcement responsibility. It's not given to Congress. It's not given to the Supreme Court. It's not given to me. The unsigned court decision, and of course it's unsigned, who wants to go into history as Trump's primary whore, reads in part, quote, an evolving electoral map, not your business, Justice X. This is not an electoral map case quote, could dramatically change the behavior of voters, parties, and states across the country in different ways and at different times. Also not your goddamn business. What the Constitution says, that's your business, not whether you're worried about reactions to it. Quote, the disruption would be all the more acute and could nullify the votes of millions and change the election result if Section 3 enforcement were attempted after the nation has voted. Again, Justice X, not asking you to do that. Nothing to do with you. You have a job. You are bad at it. It's reading the Constitution. You're corrupt. You're stupid. You should have just said, Trump told us to do it that way. At least show some self-respect. Quote, nothing in the Constitution requires that we endure such chaos, arriving at any time or different times, up to and perhaps beyond the inauguration unquote. <laughs> yeah, what was that case that Clarence Thomas was involved with? The one that forced the nation to undergo chaos arriving at any time or different times up till 39 days before the inauguration of 2001. What was that case called? The Supreme Court is full of shit. And fullest of all, is Amy Coney Barrett. In my judgment, well, that's a bad start. In my judgment, this is not the time to amplify disagreement with stridency, she writes. That has nothing to do with your job, ma'am. The court has settled a politically charged issue in the volatile season of a presidential election. You're not supposed to rule on seasons or politics or anything else of the moment. Didn't it say that in the preface when they gave you your copy of? So, you're a Supreme Court justice. What the hell do you do now? Quote, particularly in this circumstances, writings on the court should turn the national temperature down, not up. This is the same logic you will read in the Dred Scott decision, which validated slavery. It is cowardly. It is cheap. It is whorish. And boy, did Trump get his money with this clown. 
The court should turn the national temperature down, not up, said Justice Amy Karen Barrett as she voted to make sure a psychotic insurrectionist who would try to stay in office past 2029 remains on the 2024 ballot because that will really turn the national temperature down. Yeah, turn it down to 75 degrees body temperature at which all of us die of hypothermia. As the Supreme Court reporter and analyst Ellie Mistal wrote, Amy Coney Barrett would really like to speak to the Liberals' manager over the rude service she received. Ellie also wrote, The Supreme Court must be stopped. God damned right. And oh, by the way, you can read this decision as permission for any other sitting president. Gee, who's, who's the president at the moment, by the way? Any sitting president can commit any act he likes without risking the wrath of the 14th Amendment mechanism composed by better senators and better congressmen and assented to by better justices than we have today. Just saying, right now, the Supreme Court has given out specific practical immunity for, you know, trying to overthrow the government. But... I asked you last week to think about, and and sorry, I didn't mean it to sound like homework. I apologize. But I asked you to think about what would happen if the court is not trying to manage the game like some out-of-control, egotistical hockey referees assessing a penalty against one team, and the court actually winds up pairing this 9 nothing atrocity ruling for Trump on the 14th Amendment with a 6-3 to ruling also granting him presidential immunity from prosecution for anything he did in office. There are a million different answers to this, but of course the most important one is even they cannot drag out that ruling on immunity until next January 21st or something. Thus, they'd have to do it before then, and thus they would be granting presidential immunity not to Trump, but to Joe Biden. Since we would then be faced with the undeniable reality that the Supreme Court had made the president into an absolute monarch... What King Joseph Robinette Biden II, the first, could then do, and by the way, if this really happens, should do, what he could and should then do is take away the chances there's going to be a King Trump, arrest the members of the Supreme Court, arrest Trump, arrest the Speaker of the House, arrest all the other January 6th insurrectionists, and oh, by the way, postpone the election. Because... If the Supreme Court, and honestly, individually or collectively, my dogs could do a better job of being an associate justice than Amy Coney Barrett, and at least two of my dogs could do a better job than Chief Justice Roberts. Because if the Supreme Court declares that all presidents are immune from prosecution, no matter what they do, we are as of that moment. We are living in a kingdom where everything in the Constitution and all the laws and all the norms go the way of what this court just did to Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. And if we are going to be living under a king and we have a choice of King Biden or King Trump, guess which one I'm taking. And yet this does not seem to have occurred to Trump. Well, we have a pretty good idea now what the name of the problem he has is that makes it not occur to Trump. But it also doesn't seem to have occurred to any of his lawyers, nor to his cult He was still out there yesterday demanding immunity because, of course, that's all that matters to him. And at this point, you wonder if you could get past the anosognosia, if you offered him a trade here, presidential immunity, you'll never go to jail. But Biden becomes king and there's no election until he says so. You wonder if he'd take it just to save his sorry ass. Also, there'll be no refunds on the legal fees. My original thought was the chief justice and all the little justices and the puddles into which Jackson and Kagan and Sotomayor dissolved yesterday, along with Justice Amy Karen Barrett, they all attend the State of the Union Thursday night. Biden should address them directly. Why not? Justice Karen just decided that interfering in the presidential election is the court's job. Why shouldn't the president be able to answer them? Originally, I thought he should say to them, 
Hey, guys and gals, I know you've decided to stall the trials of the man to whom at least three of you owe your jobs, and judging by your, your work, they're the only jobs you'll ever get. But as you ponder this question of presidential immunity, I'd like to note, being president myself, that there has never been such a thing, and there never should be, because the first thing a president who could never face prosecution for anything could do is disappear all the members of the Supreme Court. So, you know, like the kids say, rent, don't buy. That's what I thought President Biden should say to the justices Thursday night. Now I'm not so sure. Now I'm thinking he should not say a damn thing about presidential immunity. He shouldn't say anything. He shouldn't even acknowledge they are there. He should pretend nothing's going on. That way, if these idiots who just erased an entire clause from an amendment passed at the most precarious time in this nation's history until now, if they then decide to write their own new clause and invent something called presidential immunity, the nation's surprise at their corruption would quickly be exceeded by their surprise when King Biden arrests them. So tune in Thursday for our live edition of Countdown after the State of the Union on YouTube to find out if the president let them in on the fact that the metaphorical loaded gun John Roberts and his clown car riders are holding is not just pointed at justice and American representative government, it's also pointed at themselves. Sooner than that, also of interest here, Trump's promise to, bluntly, get your kids sick and kill many of them, and that national abortion ban none of them is saying they want, Trump again says he wants, and he just made it earlier. And in the good news, Jack Smith says the DOJ 60 days until election rule does not apply to any of this. Watch the Supreme Court overrule him on that. Plus, my oldest enemy has returned for a final showdown. The enemy of my youth. The enemy of my nightmares. The auto train is alive and well and somebody has a reservation on it today. Damn you to hell, Auto Train! That's next on an all new edition of Countdown. This is Countdown with Keith Olbermann. Postscripts to the news. Some headlines, some updates, some snarks, some predictions. So much Trump news it carried over past the first commercial. Dateline Washington. The latest reporter to face plant on the spinning wheel of this is when Trump really pivots is named Sophia Cal, and she works for Axios. And about 5 a.m. yesterday, her piece went up reading, quote, Top advisors are trying with some early success to steer former President Trump to focus more on the border and the economy and less on old grievances and personal drama. In some recent speeches, Trump has avoided his typical complaint that the 2020 election he lost was, quote, stolen and instead has said we were interrupted or something very bad happened. Another sign of Trump toning things down a notch, in at least one instance, he wanted to mention a salacious claim about a rival's personal life, but co-campaign manager Susie Wiles persuaded him not to. <laughs> Lol, you mean like uh, the stuff about Susie Wiles' daughter and her resume? Anyway, that was at about 5 a.m. Trump pivots. Oh, instead of rigged, stolen, he said a bad thing happened. Just afternoon, Trump then attacked, quote, deranged Jack Smith, called the judges Trump haters, and attacked Fonnie Willis. Here is a rule we need. If you say Trump is pivoting or changing, and he contradicts you within eight hours of your article or your TV hit, you have to quit the business and go into a nunnery. 
Dateline Fort Pierce, Florida. Good Trump trial news for a change because it hasn't gotten to the Supreme Court yet. In filings to Judge Eileen, if you like Amy Coney Barrett, you're going to love me, Cannon. Jack Smith has asserted that the Department of Justice's infamous, unofficial, unwritten 60-day rule, thou shalt not undertake investigations within 60 days of an election, or maybe it's 90, or 120, or maybe it's 1,400, whatever it is, it does not apply here and will not apply to the prosecution of Trump for stealing classified documents and, you know, reading them to random passersby. The premise here, says Mr. Smith, once the case has begun, the 60-day clock ends. <laughs> Line Richmond, Virginia. Of course, only Barbara Comstock was paying attention. She used to be a Clinton hunting congresswoman from Virginia, but she noticed that in his speech there, Trump promised to take all federal funds away from public schools that require that their students get vaccines. You know, polio vaccines, chicken pox vaccines, measles vaccines, measles. Like in Florida, where they have a quack named Ladapo, who is Ron DeSantis's Surgeon General. Remember Ron DeSantis? Anyway, he's no longer enforcing the rules, demanding vaccinations of public school kids. And guess what? There's measles outbreaks in Florida. So maybe President Biden can mention this on Thursday night. Mr. Trump's apparent new campaign slogan is, Hi, I'm Donald Trump, and I'm here to kill your kids. <laughs> Dateline inside Trump's head. Don't wear your good shoes in here. Remember that national abortion ban Republicans say they don't want, but then Trump said he wanted one and he had chosen 16 weeks because it was a good round number and it meant four months. Well, now he's changed it, telling Sean Hannity, who knows something about abortions, that it's more like three months. More and more, I'm hearing about 15 weeks. It's the same word salad, the same more and more I'm hearing as the infamous Frederick Douglass birthday answer. It's fluent aphasia. <laughs> And Dateline Bristol, Connecticut, Chris Mortensen got to ESPN a year before I did. He never left until cancer claimed him Sunday. You have read about how he invented the role of inside reporter, perfected it, saw it spread throughout the National Football League, and ultimately all sports coverage. All that was true, and I don't want to minimize any of it because it put him in the Football Hall of Fame. But I need to tell you about the man I worked with in all of my three full-time tenures at ESPN – who hugged me goodbye the first time I left and hugged me when I came back the first time and hugged me again when I came back the second time. I used to play pool with Chris Mortensen, though why, I don't know. When he wasn't focusing on the game, when he was working on a story or he was in a mood to talk, he would only run the table on the rest of us ooh, once or twice in a row. When he was not distracted, there was absolutely no reason for anybody else in the entire pool room to make the effort to hold on to their cue. The best non-professional pool player I have ever seen. More importantly, Chris Mortensen had the best professional journalistic ethics I have ever seen. I happened to be with him one day, sitting next to him, in the seldom-used ESPN radio work area. It was quiet and unoccupied, and he was talking by phone to Art Shell, then the coach of the then Los Angeles Raiders, about an important story. I heard him reassure Art Shell that it was off the record, and he would never quote him, nor give away his identity, nor even hint that he had confirmed the story Mort had brought to him. And I was also in the studio maybe a week later as we carried live, I think, Art Shell's news conference as he sat there next to the team owner, Al Davis, and utterly denied the story which he himself had confirmed to Chris Mortensen. And he called Chris Mortensen out by name and he insulted him. And then they put Mort on the air. And Mort did not do what I would have done, what almost anybody in our profession would have done, and with good reason and explain what the truth was there. Later, I was in the hallway, and I saw Mort, and I just put my hands out, palms up, wordlessly, in a gesture of astonishment, and Mort knew what I meant, and he said, just because he didn't live up to his word doesn't give me the right 
to not live up to mine. That's who died Sunday. Chris Mortensen was 72 years old. Still ahead of us on this all-new edition of Countdown. You ever heard of the auto train? I've heard of the auto train. I survived the auto train when I was 13 years old. And I've had a vendetta in for the auto train ever since. And I read something in the 80s about how the auto train didn't exist anymore. Well, guess what? It was a lie. The auto train is still running. It's running at this moment. And somewhere on one of the auto trains, all of the toilets are backing up. Coming up in things I promise not to tell. First, yes, still more idiots to talk about. The daily roundup of the miscreants, morons, and Dunning-Kruger effect specimens who constitute today's worst persons in the world. They smell like backed up toilets. The bronze, worse, Jesse Waters, the one-time Bill O'Reilly thug who now continues the tradition of racism and stupidity that Bill set on Fox. After the Joe Biden, Seth Meyers ice cream viral video, Waters went on Fox and said it wasn't manly to lick an ice cream cone in public. Worse yet, he tried to imply that doing so was evidence that Biden is impaired. Quote, you know who lights up for ice cream? Children and the elderly, according to the Alzheimer's Association. Ice cream is a favorite for people with diminished faculties. That's when the Daily Beast dug up a Facebook post from August 2019 with photos of two employees at a place on the Jersey Shore called Iceberg Ice Cream posing with Jesse Waters. Jesse Waters holding an ice cream cone. Caption, I'm Waters and this is my world. Shout out to Jesse Waters for stopping in tonight. Now, I'm not saying Jesse Waters has Alzheimer's, but if you're only 45 and you've already forgotten when you got photographed in public licking some ice cream, you might want to see a specialist. Happily, it's probably not an illness. It's just that Jesse is a freaking moron. The runner-up, worser, Daryl Leon McClanahan III. Now, he is hardly the favorite among the candidates in the primary for the Republican nomination for the governor of Missouri, but he's one of them. And a Missouri Republican reposted a 2019 photo of him found by the Anti-Defamation League in which would-be Missouri Governor McClanahan III is shown standing next to a guy who's in full Ku Klux Klan hood and robe. And they are both giving the Hitler Nazi salute. And oh, by the way, just to complete the image, they're both standing in front of a burning cross. Now, McClanahan has told the St. Louis newspaper that he sued the ADL because it said or implied that he was a member of the Klan. Not true, Daryl Leon III says in the lawsuit. He only had, quote, honorary memberships in the Ku Klux Klan. Well, that's better. Plus, I assume that way you don't have to buy your own hood and robe. You can just rent them. Like shoes at a bowling alley. A bowling alley that happens to be in front of a burning cross. But our winner, the worst... Kristen Welker. I would like to say as an aside that there is a report in the New York Post from last night that a series of bed bugs have been found at NBC News World Headquarters in New York. I assume that is a coincidence. We've been through all this before, of course. It's more evident than ever that there was some kind of grand compromise at NBC News. Chuck Todd would indeed leave Meet the Press, claim it was his own decision, but only if he was allowed to choose his successor. And the successor that Chuck would choose would be the one who would make everybody say, God, we miss Chuck Todd. Won't you please bring him back? The new one is unbelievably worse. There is no way of knowing if Kristen Welker wrote this line herself. When I did NBC Nightly News a couple of times, it was a half an hour show with about three minutes of actual copy in it. They had four writers and the four writers were arguing over whether to start one sentence with and, two votes for and, and there were two votes for but. They gave me the decisive vote. And I said, it it doesn't matter. And I thought one of them would start crying. 
But back to the point. I mean, even Chuck Todd covered politics before he got his job with NBC News and screwed up Meet the Press. Kristen Welker majored in history, became a local newscaster in Providence and in Redding, California, and was a weekend anchor in Philly when they started bringing her in to do fill-ins on like 90-second newscasts that ran late nights at MSNBC, and then boom, White House correspondent. That is her training. One year at NBC News, and then 12 years as a White House correspondent, so that means 13 years of doing whatever her bosses told her to do. So who knows if she even understood what she was saying when she said on Meet the Press in a voice perfectly suited to voice over one of those smarmy lead-in pieces on Dateline that the Supreme Court was considering, quote, Mr. Trump's claim that he's immune from criminal prosecution for allegedly trying to overturn the 2020 election. Well, with language like that, she's got a Supreme Court job in her future, don't she? Allegedly, allegedly tried to overturn the 2020 election. He admits he did it. There's no allegedly. There's no crime in this sentence. There's no reason to put in allegedly. He did it. He boasts about it. Allegedly, like allegedly the sun rises in the east or allegedly Kristen Welker and her bosses have all decided that they're going to be damned if they lose their jobs if Trump regains power or allegedly Kristen Welker is an idiot. No need for allegedly. Kristen Welker, the NBC president in charge of Meet the Press, is named Rebecca Blumenstein. The chairman of NBC News is Cesar Conde, and the three of them should all be fired. Allegedly. Two days. Worse person in the world! The number one story on the countdown and things I promise not to tell. And every once in a while, something will suddenly appear in the newspaper that you actually do not expect. I find the number of these things has been diminishing steadily since I started reading newspapers about 1966. But every once in a while, something is utterly shocking. I quote the Washington Post. Amtrak has 37 routes that crisscross the United States. Three of them are profitable. Huh. Two of those, the Northeast Regional and the High Speed Acela, traverse the heavily populated territory between Boston and the Mid-Atlantic. I like those trains. The third, according to an Amtrak representative, is the auto train, which carries passengers and their motor vehicles between Lorton, Virginia and Sanford, Florida. Ooh. Ooh. My earliest enemy. I thought you were dead, Auto Train. I thought you were dead. Now you may wish you had been. The auto train might seem like an unlikely contender, the Post continues, to be a moneymaker for Amtrak. It operates on one single route in the southeast, a region not known for a reliance on trains. It makes no true stops on its approximately 900-mile journey. I thought the auto train had gone out of business and the rest of us were all safe, particularly me. And it turns out in reading the rest of the Washington Post article that, in fact, sometime in the 80s, this bizarre train did, in fact, stop running. It was no longer profitable. It was run by a private company, and they went out of business. And then they brought it back. And now it's the third most profitable of the three profitable Amtrak routes in the country. And as I read this article, I was flashed back to March of 1972, when I was 13 years old, and Dad announced, guess what, Keith, we are going to Florida for spring training. I have to go see my dad for something, and he lives in Naples, Florida. So we're going to go down there by train, and I'm going to take our car with us. And I said, 
I heard nothing beyond the phrase, we're going to spring training. We would wind up eventually in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, the then home of the New York Yankees, the team of my youth, and the rest of it was just detail. We drove from Westchester County, outside of New York City, to Lorton, Virginia, although I think it was called something else then, or the actual destination point where the auto train left from in Virginia was a different city than Lorton, because I would have thought of Horton, and I would have thought of Dr. Seuss, and then I would have hated Dr. Seuss all these years. In any way, a case, we were in Virginia somewhere, and it rained the whole trip. Five, six, 30, 80 hours in the car. But Dad wanted to bring the car. The car was a Cadillac, a big Cadillac. I would say it's the size of eight or ten SUVs. If you sat in the back and wanted to talk to Dad, you had to lean forward and yell. It was a big car, and moreover, it meant everything to my dad, and not because he was a car fanatic. My dad grew up with his father, who we were going to see via auto train, in the Bronx in the 1930s. And often, as he said, they went a couple of years without consistent hot water in their apartment. My grandfather, who I may have mentioned once, had a city job, got a promotion, came into work in his usual attire of a open-necked, what we would now call a, kind of a soft shirt or a polo shirt. He was told he had to wear a shirt and tie, so he quit on the spot. And as Dad said, they went from making about $2,000 a year during the Depression to making $180 the next year from recycling comic books. Every once in a while, either my grandmother or grandfather would show up at school to pick my dad up and walk him to their new apartment because they had moved out of their apartment in his absence because they didn't have the money to pay the rent. It was that kind of childhood. My dad was offered a scholarship to Cornell Architecture. He couldn't go because his father said, if you go, your younger brother has to quit high school and go to work. Also, I don't have the money to send you to Ithaca, New York on the bus. You'll have to hitchhike. That was my father's childhood. He somehow managed to become an architect without going to college. He had licenses in 40 states by 1972, and he had a Cadillac, and not only that, he leased it. So he had a new Cadillac every other year, and eventually every year, and he loved that car. And he wanted to show it to his father. And so we took the auto train. As we got into the car to go to wherever, Virginia, to get on the auto train, which you just got out of your car and drove it up onto a rack of some sort and it got loaded into the back of the train and then you walked half a mile to the front of the train where the sleeping quarters and the cars, the coaches were. As we got into our car, our Cadillac, his Cadillac, Dad made the big reveal. Now, I couldn't get any sleeping compartments on the way down, only on the way back. What? Yeah, we're, we're, we'll be sleeping in coach. It's, it's all right. We'll, it gets there very early in the morning. It's only a couple of hours. Huh. Well, again, I was only thinking about the going to see the Yankees in spring training for the first time in my life part. I did not hear that part. So I had brought with me a couple of editions of the sporting news. I can still see the cover. It was an article about fighting and hockey with a picture of Dale Hoganson of the Montreal Canadien on the cover. I brought my favorite pillow, and we got on the train and enjoyed the late March sights such as they were in Virginia, and then it got dark, and then we ate, and then only as 9, 9, 30, 10 p.m. hit and we decided to go to sleep did I find out that... A, they did not turn all the lights off on trains just because Keith wanted to go to sleep. B, people did not stop using the aisle in the train just because I was trying to sleep. And C, I had no memory of ever trying to sleep sitting up before. After a couple of hours of not sleeping, my dad and I went and played cards in the food car. And then we went to try it again. And of course, first I said, let me use the bathroom before we go. And I went to the toilet and it had been locked because it was broken. So we went to the next car and that toilet had overflowed and was broken. And we went to the next car and that one was broken. There were no operative toilets after 10 p.m. And guess what else that produced? A very, very nice smell throughout all of the cars. 
I have no memory whatsoever of sleeping that night, just getting angrier and angrier at the auto train. And my dad said it'll be entirely different on the way back. We are going to have our own compartment. You will have never noticed it, just the way all those people sleeping in those compartments over there never noticed it. And I said, why didn't we get one? He said they didn't have any available. I said, how about some other year? I was kind of upset, but dad had his car with him, so that was the important part. Well, I don't remember many of the tales of getting off the train. I like to think, in retrospect, I may have waited for it to slow down and I just jumped and walked to Florida, but I don't think that happened. We got to the area near Orlando, Sanford, Florida, a place I once went to again about 1995 or so for ESPN, and I got cold, and it was 90 degrees there, and I still got cold from the memory of the auto train. And it turned out that Dad had also not been completely transparent about why we were going to see his father. It turned out the trip was not really about spring training. It was about showing the Cadillac to his father and also uh, being there because my grandfather, my dad's father, was undergoing a serious kidney operation that really was something of a risk to his life. So we went to this rather small hospital, which surprised me, and I can't remember if it was in Naples or North Naples, which is where I think he lived, in a parked truck of some kind with his second wife, Winnie, who was appalling. Maybe it was a motor home. I don't remember. It was not very impressive. Dad's Cadillac had more room in it. It was, however, more impressive than the auto train, and it took me two or three days to stop making remarks about the auto train to my father. In any event, we went there, and it was the day of my grandfather's surgery, and we were waiting in the waiting room in this small hospital that was small enough that the waiting room was on the floor of the operating theaters. In fact, it was separated only by swinging double doors. I think wooden swinging double doors, like wood paneling in somebody's basement from 1962 with big windows in them. So at one point, my father said, here he comes. And it wasn't my grandfather he was referring to. It was the surgeon. The surgeon came out and we stood to greet him and looked through the windows of these swinging doors down towards the operating theaters, I don't know, 50 yards away, 40 yards away, something distant but still visible. So we're all standing there, and out comes the surgeon, and he has still most of his surgical attire on. I remember it bloodied. I don't think it really was bloodied. But he came out, and he started with, Mr. Alderman, I'm very sorry to tell you. There was an interesting series of reactions then. I don't remember my sister, who then would have been about four, having much of a reaction to this. I think I saw a suppressed smile crossing my mother's face. My father was impassive. The surgeon went on, and I went into shock to explain that my grandfather had died on the operating table. So far, this was the best trip we'd ever been on, right? And as he's going on as to what happened and how they tried and they were resuscitating, I was drawn to something I saw in the distance over the surgeon's shoulder through the windows of those swinging double doors down towards the actual surgical theaters. It was a nurse running towards us as fast as she possibly could. And as the surgeon was solemnly saying, we are very sorry on behalf of the hospital, we can provide you with a priest or a minister or a rabbi or whatever your choice. The doors swing open and the nurse says, Doctor, there's a pulse! And he says, he looks at her, looks back at us, looks at her again and goes, excuse me, and runs down the hall with her. Two hours later, I was in my grandfather's room and he was sitting there and of course, being from the Bronx, from the early 1900s, he could not say my name correctly. Neither of my grandfathers could pronounce TH as an individual sound. TH was just another T. How you doing, Keith? And I said, how are you doing? He said, I'm all right. I'm a little foggy. I said, so you were dead. That's what they tell me. I said, so what was it like? I think a lot of people would like to know. And he said, What the hell are you talking about? 
I was dead. What would I know what it was like? I was dead. It was nothing. They put me out, they wake me up, and they tell me I was dead. Go ask your father you want to know what it's like when you're dead. I never found out what that meant. So I did go ask my father, and I said, listen, what happened here? He said, well, this is what they're telling us. They tried to resuscitate him, and the surgeon came out, and they were about to put the sheet over him, and they'd already put down the time of death when that nurse that we all saw, who I think, I appreciate her enthusiasm, but maybe she could have handled it a little differently because she just took five years off my life, my father said. The nurse saw a pulse on the blipper there, as he called it. And sure enough, he was back. Now, it's probable that they had been trying to resuscitate him, and as they decided they had failed and gave up, that was the moment it all clicked in, and within a few seconds, his heartbeat was visible. I I don't think what happened is what you think happened. And I went, well, what I think happened the last time, they gave the guy who did it his own religion. And my father looked at me and he said, let's just get out of here. He's fine. He saw my Cadillac. And we don't want him having his own religion. The rest of the trip was fairly uneventful, considering that I'd just seen my own grandfather come back from the dead, apparently without any help. We went to many spring training games and got to see a lot of old ballparks that don't exist anymore, like the old one in St. Petersburg, where we saw the Cardinals and the Cincinnati Reds. And then we went cross state via the Oki Finoki Trail, it's the Watanabe, the Wasada, whatever the road is that goes through that has all the alligators on it, the alligator alley thing. So we're in the other side of Florida, and we went to what was then beautiful Fort Lauderdale Stadium, Fort Lauderdale Yankee Stadium, and saw about half a dozen games, and I had been to spring training for the first time in my life, and just just to top it off, we go back to the hotel, and my dad says, got a surprise for you, I bought season tickets for the Yankee games this year. Four tickets to each Yankee home game in the year 1972. I was a happy guy. I had forgotten the nightmares of death and, even worse, the auto train. By the way, the tickets, four of them for 81 Yankee home games, many doubleheaders, probably about 70 different days, maybe 68, 70 different days. Four tickets every game, $1,000. Parking, well, that was a little more. That was another $100 for the whole season. Reserved parking right across the street from the stadium in the front row. (sighs) A different world half a century ago. Well, now all the adventures of my first trip to Florida and my first trip to baseball spring training and my first and last trip on the auto train were complete. Except for the return trip. We drove back to Sanford, Florida, and... We had those sleeping compartments, and they made all the difference in the world. We had a nice dinner on the train. We checked all the bathrooms. We had a little private bathroom in the two-room suite my father had gotten for the occasion. So we didn't even need to worry about whether or not the toilets would completely fail and fill the cars with a combination of chemical smell and the other smell you associate with bathrooms. And everything was fine. We went to bed early, and then I woke up around dawn, freezing. And I mean freezing. We had transported ourselves from Florida into Georgia, and the heat did not come on. And it did not come on all the way to, I don't think it was Lorton, Virginia. I like to think of it as auto train Virginia, and I like to think of it as a place that has no permanent residence. But apparently, that's where the auto train still lives waiting, waiting for me, waiting. Happily, I don't drive, so screw you, auto train. train is still running. Screw you, auto train! 
I can still smell the smell. I've done all the damage I can do here. Thank you for listening. Countdown musical directors Brian Ray and John Philip Chanel arranged, produced, and performed most of our music. Mr. Ray was on guitars, bass, and drums, and Mr. Chanel handled orchestration and keyboards. And it was produced by TKO Brothers. Other music, including some of the Beethoven compositions, were arranged and performed by the group No Horns Allowed. The sports music is the Olbermann theme from ESPN2, written by Mitch Warren Davis, courtesy of ESPN Inc. Our satirical and pithy musical comments are by Nancy Faust, the best baseball stadium organist ever. Our announcer today was my friend Kenny Main. Everything else was pretty much my fault. That's countdown for today, eight months exactly, until the 2024 presidential election, the 1,155th day since Dementia J. Trump's first attempted coup against the democratically elected government of the United States. Use the 14th Amendment, the Insurrection Act, the justice system, the mental health system, and if it happens, presidential immunity to stop him from doing it again while we still can. The next scheduled countdown is tomorrow. Do not forget our live YouTube special after the State of the Union Thursday night, sponsored by Auto Train. I made that part up. Bulletins as the news warrants. Till next time, I'm Keith Olbermann. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, and good luck.